Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for December 20th, 2020. We are in still in Unit 1 uh, for the winter quarter, and we, which is entitled The Beginning of a Call. The Beginning of a Call, and we are in Lesson 3 from our Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly. Our lesson title is International Honor for the King of the World. International Honor for the King of the World. Our devotional reading is taken from Exodus chapter 1, verses 8 to 24. Our background scripture taken from Matthew chapter 2, verses 7 to 15. Uh, and our key verse is verse 11, which reads from the King James Version, When they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. The lesson aims, or number one, explain how the wise men point to the global nature of Jesus' mission. Number two, grieve for those who suffer innocently due to the world's brokenness and sin. And number three, join with peoples of every ethnicity and culture to worship Jesus, the King of all nations. The Adult Quarterly lesson has three divisions after the introduction. The first is entitled Searching for the Light. That's covered between chapter 2, verses 7 to 9. The second is Seeing the Light. That's covered between verses 10 and 12. And the third is Scripture About the Light. And that's covered between verses 13 and 15. From the Standard Commentary, our lesson title is Called to Worship. Called to Worship. And we have a couple of additional verses in our lesson text. uh, Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And then also verses 7 to 15. Additional aims from the Standard or number 1. Identify the Old Testament sources used within the lesson text. Uh, we, we know that Matthew ref- uses a lot of uh, the Old Testament or quotes from the Old Testament prophets. Number two, compare and contrast the motives behind the two expressed desires to worship Jesus. And then number three, worship the Lord in the reverent and sacrificial spirit of the wise men. All right, we have a great lesson today. Uh, The passage, of course, uh, or should be very familiar to to us uh, and one that we might uh, at first glance think that there's nothing more to learn about this narrative. However, as I say often, uh, whenever I go through and read a passage again, when I study a passage again, invariably I find something new that I didn't know before. So we are going to uh, give a little background, um, have a brief word of prayer, and then we're going to get into our lesson text uh, verse by verse. Uh, last week we we read uh, the about the genealogy of uh, the Lord Jesus. Uh, as given uh, by Matthew, from Matthew chapter 1, beginning at verse 18. Uh, We saw that he was an heir to the throne of David, as was prophesied that the Messiah would be. We know in Luke's account, we see that he's also an heir through Mary's uh, uh, ancestry uh, uh, from David as well. Uh, and uh, at least back to David, I should say, as well. And so by by blood, natural birth, if you will, or physically, uh, as well as uh, 
the being a, a, a an heir, a legal heir to the throne. Jesus was both. Okay, and we're going to uh, see in the lesson uh, today that uh, men uh, from the east, that is east of Jerusalem or east of Judea, perhaps Persia or uh, other areas east of uh, Judea uh, had come to worship. We're going to spend a little time explaining what they actually did in their worship. Uh, a newborn king, okay, as far as they knew, he was king of the Jews, but there was something miraculous about his birth uh, as it was declared or announced in the stars or by a special star, I should say. Um, and with that, uh, we, we again, we're familiar with the background, um, and we are praying that uh, that all of us are focusing on the true meaning of Christian of Christmas. Uh, I know this is going to be a different Christmas for many of us as we're not able to gather as we have in years past. Uh, but however, we'll pray that we will uh, we will really rejoice in what the meaning of this celebration is, and that is the advent, the first advent of our Lord and Savior into this world who brought light, who brought truth, but most importantly, brought his life to be sacrificed for our sin. And Father, we do thank you and praise you that in the fullness of time, you sent forth your son, made of a woman, made under the law, Lord, to redeem those under the law and all those who were condemned by the law, Lord. We were dead in our trespasses and sin. And we thank you for sending your son, a savior of the world, to bear our sins on the cross. And Lord, please let us uh, this uh, holiday season, this Christmas season, Lord, to remember what you did, Lord, and why you did it, Lord, because you so loved us. We thank you and we praise you, Lord, for all those who are listening to this lesson. We pray that you'd give us an understanding, a greater understanding of this familiar passage, Lord. And Lord, we pray as we as we study your word more generally, Lord, that you would always give us a clear understanding of it. And as we understand your word, we pray that you would increase our faith. And as our faith is increased, Lord, we pray that you would increase our obedience to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're going to read the text uh, for our first uh, passage. And in fact, I'm going to start with verses 1 and 2 of Matthew chapter 2, uh, which are also included in our standard commentary lesson text. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Now, these men refer to as wise men from the east. Again, they may have come from Persia. They may have come from uh, some other region, again, east of Judea. Um, or called in the Greek magi, and magi uh, is a root word from which uh, magician is derived. And they were men who uh, studied the the signs of nature and supposedly uh, were able to determine the will of God. Uh, in doing so, uh, by divining uh, the future, uh, again, as I said, uh, using uh, various elements of nature, such as the stars, weather patterns, the behavior of animals. And we know that uh, we, we were not unfamiliar with them. We, we saw them in Genesis uh, chapter 41, verse 8, when uh, the Pharaoh... Uh, uh, had dreams that he could not interpret, nor could he remember them. We, we recall when Joseph 
uh, the butler remembered Joseph uh, that was in prison who was able to interpret his dreams. Also, Daniel, we see in Daniel chapter 2, uh, verses 2 to 11, uh, where Nebuchadnezzar uh, had dreams that he could not interpret and how Daniel was able to interpret. Well, Daniel and Joseph were not magi, but we see in those instances how the magi were called or summoned by the kings to interpret the dreams. And again, they were always uh, on the lookout for signs that would give them uh, some understanding of the will of the gods. And they were often found in uh, the court of kings or the court of royalty. Now, no doubt uh, these particular magi or wise men had become familiar with uh, the Jews and various uh, Jewish prophecies uh, while the Jews were in captivity in Babylon. In fact, there were still probably a large number of Jews in Babylon. And so they become familiar with uh, the Jewish faith, with uh, their prophecies. And this is one that uh, they were on the lookout for, this uh, some sign of this Messiah that was promised. So verse 2 says, where is he? They come and they, and they ask, where is he who was born king of the Jews? Now they come to Jerusalem. Uh, they've been guided by a star. We'll, we'll learn more about that in a few minutes. Uh, that was an unusual star. I mean, they, they were familiar with the stars and various constellations and so forth. So when one unusual that they had never seen before appeared, and perhaps it was more brilliant or it was something that caused it to stand out among the other stars, uh, they understood that it uh, portended that something uh, great was happening. Uh, and they interpreted that to be the birth of a king. And, uh, and they followed that star to uh, Jerusalem. And they had, uh, of course, uh, again, interpreted it to be the birth of a, a king, uh, the, uh, the announcement, if you will, the heavenly announcement of the birth of a king. And so they went to where they would expect that birth to occur. The, the the capital of Judea, Jerusalem, where Roy, where the king and where the the priests uh, were. Since they were in Judea, they assumed this king would be king of the Jews. So this is the first time we hear Jesus declared king of the Jews. Where is he that is born king of the Jews? Uh, verse two a tells us, and uh, we know later uh, on Pilate. Uh, we'll refer to him as King of the Jews. He will, uh, that will be uh, a label that is affixed to the cross over his head uh, when he is crucified. Now, and part B of 2 says, for we have seen his star in the east. Again, uh, they interpreted this star to be the announcement of the birth of this king, this great king, uh, which they did not fully understand who he was, but they knew there was something great about him uh, with this um, unusual star announcing his birth. Now, you know, we might ask ourselves, um, why would God uh, use uh, a sign in the heaven to announce God's birth? when he forbids uh, astrologers and soothsayers and div diviners uh, in the Old Testament. We could go to Deuteronomy chapter 4, 19, or chapter 18, verses 9 to 14, and see where, where God clearly forbids uh, the practice of divination or uh, are really uh, watching the signs, trying to discern truths from the signs and so forth. Well, uh, I agree with uh, one commentator uh, that says, well, God used uh, a medium that was familiar to these pagans, that the pagans uh, used, and that was the stars. He used astrology to announce the birth of uh, the Christ. He also used dreams. Now, we know he used dreams uh, 
uh, with prophets and with other people that of faith that he used throughout the Old and New Testaments. But he also, but since the uh, heathen or the uh, pagan uh, astrologers and uh, magi uh, gave regard to dreams as well. We'll find out later. He uses dreams to speak to them, to direct them as well. So now let's pick up at verse um, 7. We're going to read the first uh, division of, or passage for the first division from the adult quarterly. And that, that again, that division is titled Seeing the Light, verses 10 to 12. And I'm going to read from the King James Version. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented him with gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. Now, we jumped over verses 3 to 6. And in verses 3 to 6, um, we learn uh, more about uh, Herod's reception of the uh, these magi uh, and perhaps... Most likely, they are wealthy. Uh, they've come with a large entourage. Uh, and uh, he uh, has asked his priests and scribes to find out where the Messiah is to be born. And, of course, his religious experts advise him that uh, the Messiah is to be born uh, in Bethlehem. Uh, and they get, they get that from Micah, chapter 5, verses 2 to 4. And Bethlehem was about six miles south of Jerusalem, so not far from Jerusalem. And, uh, of course, um, Herod is, uh, of course, a, uh, a tyrant who is really uh, very uh, uh, glutton for power, uh, and he's done uh, terrible acts to retain power. And, of course, he's quelled any... Um, acts of uh, sedition or any attempts to challenge his power. And he is suspicious of these uh, magi. And uh, we, we, we know that he in, uh, asked them to, uh, after he gets the location of where the Messiah is to be born, he, he tells them to go and seek diligently for him and tells them that, uh, and then when they do come back to him, and let him know specifically where this uh, king, this newborn king is, so that he might come and worship him as well. So on their departure, yep, let's go back. Well, let me just say that we know, and of course, probably all those in his court, and certainly the priests knew that, uh, Herod was being deceitful in saying that he wanted to worship uh, the child as well. And we might say a, a little more about this term used here, worship. When the uh, Magi announced that they wanted to worship him, they want, and that we can go back to, uh, again, uh, chapter 2, I'm sorry, verse 2, part C, uh, they said uh, they, they had come to worship him. Uh, they don't recognize him as God in the flesh uh, and deserving of the worship of a deity. Uh, that word that they're using, worship, uh, means obe obeisance. It means simply to bow and give uh, the uh, humble gesture that, that all kings or royalty are deserving of. Uh, and that, so that's what is meant by worship here to give, to do obeisance or, or, or to give, uh, a, a deep bow and, uh, an honor and respect to the new King. And that's what Herod, no doubt means as well. When he says he wants to come and worship, that means to do obeisance to him. Uh, and, uh, of course he is 
deceptive in what he is saying. Verse 9 says, So when they, they heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over the over where the young child was. So we can uh, understand from this that perhaps they had not seen the star in some time. The star had guided them to Judea and maybe even as uh, uh, they, they assumed once they got there that this child would be born in the capital uh, and perhaps in the royal palace, the palace of the king. So they went there first. And they may have been a bit disappointed to find out, hey, he's not uh, being born here. And so they asked, where is he being born? Uh, Pilate, uh, sorry, uh, not Pilate, but Herod has no uh, newborn uh, sons. And so uh, uh, he perhaps thinks that either they're, uh, they're there to stir up some type of uh, sedition or some type of uh, potential overthrow eventually, or uh, they're simply mistaken. He doesn't know. Uh, anyway, so when they see this star reappear, it reappears after they leave. And we know they probably got directions from the uh, the religious leaders as to how to get to Bethlehem. But it's dark, and uh, once they get to Bethlehem, uh, uh, knowing exactly where the child is is going to be something uh difficult for them to determine uh, not and they don't know what the child looks like uh, who the parents are and so uh, the star reappears and it, it has got to be something that is really uh, extraordinary in its appearance because they recognize it right off and uh, it goes and it's it, it positions itself right over where the child is now contrary to popular uh, belief or culture and, and, and nativity scenes. Uh, this does not happen on the night Jesus was born. This is some time afterwards, perhaps uh, several months, maybe even more than a year. Uh, and Joseph and Mary and the baby Jesus are in a house. We learn that in just a minute. Uh, so the star positions itself and they are able to find it just the way uh, the angel uh, gave spe a, a specific enough location for the baby Jesus on the night that he was born to the shepherds that were in the field. He said, you're going to see this child in a manger, okay? He's going to be in a born in a manger. So uh, not many ch children were wrapped in swaddling clothes and put in mangers so that the shepherds were able to find him by that direction. Verse 10, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. They were overjoyed. I mean, they may have had some doubt as to whether, hey, uh, they had come that far uh, uh, on, a, on a lark, uh, and maybe that since they, there was no newborn child in Herod's uh, household or in the palace, uh, they, 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 they might have been on a wild goose chase, but God reconfirmed or conf that they were not by sh allowing that star to reappear, and they rejoiced exceedingly because it was confirmed then that they not come that far in vain, that there, there was a, another king, uh, and uh, so they, again, they were overjoyed. Move into the second division which is entitled Seeing the Light. And that's covered between uh, Matthew chapter 2, verses 10 and 12. Again, from the King James Version, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding joy. We covered that verse. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, her mother, or his Mary and rather his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasure, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream they, that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. Okay, so we see they come into the house. The star, again, I don't know how, how it did, but the star was... 
uh, positioned in such a way that uh, it was directly over where the, 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 the young boy now, Jesus, and his parents are. So they've gotten situated uh, in a house. And uh, the Magi, uh, again, probably accompanied by uh, a huge entourage, and we are not uh, told the number of them. Again, a, a popular uh, belief or culture, uh, and certainly our nativity scenes suggest that there were three, and and also that there were three kings. We're not told that they were kings. They were, they, in fact, they were most likely not kings. They were wise men, and probably more than three. And the reason. Uh, Many suspect that there were three was because three gifts were presented. Uh, and so verse 11a says, And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. Again, this is not uh, with an understanding that they are worshipping God, but they are simply uh, uh doing a bowing and uh and actually doing obeisance to uh, a, a a king uh as as they would any other king and, and a great king at that they they know there's something special about him but certainly they don't recognize him as god part b says and when they had opened their treasures they presented unto him gifts gold and frankincense and myrrh we know a lot, uh, we've heard many messages, perhaps sermons, uh, that give an understanding of the meaning of these particular gifts. I'm not going to get into much discussion about that, but the goal uh, was emblematic of his uh, royalty. Uh, uh, that's a gift for kings. Uh, the the incense, the frankincense was an incense that was used in in, in worship and spoke of his priestly office. And then the myrrh, of course, was a, a spice and something that was used in the embalming, the external embalming of uh, people. Uh, we know that the, uh, the Jews had a custom of, they, uh, they could not embalm internally, but they wrapped uh, corpses and they put spices in the wrapping around the corpses. We know that Joseph of Arimathea brought a hundred pounds of myrrh uh, uh, to, for the burial of Jesus. And so uh, the, uh, without getting into, again, a, a great explanation as the, to, to the further meaning of those gifts, these are the gifts that they brought and they presented them uh, to the baby Jesus and, and recognition of his royalty uh, again, and and with an understanding of the fact that he was going to be some someone great because of this announcement that God had provided in the stars. Now, verse 12 says, And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. Again, we know God used dreams for his prophets. Uh, as well as other folk in the in the Bible, Old and New Testament, this is also a medium that the Magi understood, and I happen to believe that God gave them each the same dream. If He'd given only one of them the dream, uh, He would have had uh, maybe a hard time convincing the others, however many there were. So um, I believe He gave them all the same dream. And they all were convinced that they should not go back to Herod. Uh, and they went roundabout, a roundabout way uh, back to their own home. Now we're going to move into our third and final division. Scripture about the light. Scripture about the light. Beginning at verse 13, verses 13 to 15 um, are the text, is the text for this passage. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Verse 14, 
When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord, by the prophet saying, out of Egypt have I called my son. Okay, we're going to back up verse 13. Verse 13a, and it says, when when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord, it says, the King James says, the angel of the Lord. We're not going to make a distinction there. It was an angel, uh, not a pre-incarnate Christ in this case, but a messenger from God. We're not told uh, anymore. Appeared to Joseph in a dream. This is the way God communicated to Joseph. We recall the announcement uh, by the angel that the, uh, or the, that the, the, the pregnancy was caused by an in Mary was caused by an overshadowing of the Holy Spirit that the child uh, that that uh, would, and he was to be named Jesus for he should save his people from their sins. Uh, so God has said, already spoken to Joseph on a few occasions, and he's speaking to Joseph again via a dream, and he tells him to get up, take the child and his mother, and flee into Egypt. And stay there till I bring you word, he's saying. He says, because Herod's going to seek the young child to destroy it. Now, some have speculated uh, if the angel hadn't uh, warned Joseph that Herod would have killed Jesus. That that was not God's plan. God was not going to allow Herod to kill Jesus by any means. So some other means of, of uh, preserving of the Lord Jesus as a baby would have been provided. But let's notice what Joseph does. So part, uh, the second part of that says, I'm sorry, uh, 14, verse 14 says, so when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed unto Egypt. So he does, he follows the direction of the angel immediately. Uh, he does not uh, dilly-dally. He does not procrastinate, he gets up and he gets moving. And that is what the Lord wants us to do uh, whenever he gives us a commandment or clear direction. He wants us to obey him immediately, you know, sometimes, uh, or, or at the timing that he tells us to. You know, when we delay our obedience, uh, it becomes disobedience. So so Joseph gets up and, and may, I don't know whether this is the night, same night that the uh, the Magi left or the next, but as soon as he is given direction or instruction to move to Egypt, he does. Now, at this time, there were still, uh, there was a large number of Jews in Egypt uh, uh, living normal lives. Uh, and really, this is centuries after the Exodus, of course. And there is a lot of, and these uh Jews living in Egypt uh, have various, um, you know, uh, high sta uh, high positions in 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 commerce and business there, and there uh, is a lot of traffic between Judea and Egypt, and so Joseph going there uh, was not uh, didn't arise or, or, or didn't raise any particular suspicion. He was a carpenter by trade and able, probably able to make a, a decent living there. And 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 I'm, not, uh, just knowing what I know about the dates, uh, he probably was not there for much longer than a year or so, because Herod the Great, we know, died in 4 B.C. And, you know, Jesus was born around that time. We know there's a two year or so, uh, just, well, it could be up to four years. Uh, in the uh, misunderstanding of the exact date that Jesus was born. And we, we know that that was caused by, a, uh, uh, actually it was caused by a scribe or a monk in the 6th century. We're not going to get into that. But anyway, uh, so he said he would be there until he, he got word again. And verse, uh, and that, and they stayed there until the angel brings him word again, and that's not in our lesson text today. Verse 15 says, And was there until the death of Herod, 
uh, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, out of Egypt have I called my son. Now, as I said, what was not there is when he, when he actually comes out. We know that the statement was made that he was there until in obedience again to the angel until the Lord uh, via the angel tells him to return uh, and, uh, and and he gives them more specific information about who's reigning at that time. Now, the prophecy, we know that, again, the angel had already announced to Joseph um, uh, the circumstances of uh, the birth of Jesus, uh, and that was in fulfillment. Uh, that was in Matthew chapter 2, verse 6, and uh, that was in fulfillment of Isaiah 7.14. Matthew, again, uh, uses a lot of Old Testament uh, quotes from a lot of Old Testament prophets. Uh, this particular one is from Hosea 11.1. Uh, uh, which tells uh, that, which says uh, Jesus is going to be called out of Egypt. God is going to call his son out of Egypt. And we see that ultimately in verse 18 of chapter 2, Matthew chapter 2. And that, that I'm sorry, that's when uh, Herod rather sends uh, his soldiers to massacre the children that are two years old and under according to the time that the Magi gave him when they first saw the star in the east. So we know that Jesus is um, told to return and actually to go to Nazareth. And that's where uh, he was raised. We see that in Matthew uh, chapter 2, verses 21 and 20 to 23, when, when he was told to return and he was directed to Nazareth. And that's where he was raised. And he was, another prophecy says, he would be called a Nazarite. So he was, uh, uh, there were prophecies concerning Jesus's birth, his early years, his life, and his ultimate death by crucifixion uh, that are cited throughout the Gospels. Uh, and one of the things that you may uh, know uh, uh, that confirms the verity or the truth of the Bible is fulfilled prophecy. You know, uh, Reverend Armstrong, many of you have uh, heard him preach and teach. Uh, it really makes that clear. Fulfilled prophecy is what affirms the truth of the Bible. Now, this, again, as I said at the beginning, this passage uh, is uh, very familiar to us, uh, and it's a narrative. And you might ask yourself, well, what, what can we learn uh, from this um, that uh, we didn't, or what have we learned, if you will, that we didn't know before? Well, one of the things we might not have considered before is that when Jesus was born, God made an announcement uh, not only to those in Judea, to his people, and he did that via the shepherds uh, that were in the field. And he did not make an announcement to the rich and powerful, but to the lowly shepherds. They were on the bottom rung as far as the social economic status of that day to declare that Jesus had come for all people, you know, even the lowest among us. But he also made an appeal in this to other uh, people, but to Gentiles. These magi were Gentiles to the rest of the world, if you will, by uh, making this announcement using a medium that they were familiar with, uh, the stars, okay, or astrology. Uh, and and our, our interesting, our lesson title in the adult quarterly is International Honoring for the King of the World. And while they did not fully understand what uh, uh, God was going to ultimately do through Christ or who he truly was, uh, they recognized that God, and, and certainly uh, they recognized a God, they were pagans, of course, that was directing, uh, making an announcement and would be doing something great uh, through this newborn king. We know 2,000 plus years later that God, in the fullness of time, he brought forth 
Jesus made of a woman and made under the law to be the savior of the world and in and, 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 and fulfillment of the uh, prophecy or, or in fulfillment of the promise that he made first to Abraham that through him, through his seed, all the nations, all the peoples of the world would be blessed. And we have been so blessed. And I trust again that we will remember the true meaning of Christmas as we celebrate today. Let's celebrate the Advent, God himself entering time and space. And Colossians tells us he's the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And by him, everything consists, everything continues to exist. But one of the gifts, the myrrh that the wise men or the magi brought reminds us also of the the culmination of uh, the reason that he came, and that was to give his life uh, for our sins, to, to die on the cross for our sins. So while we celebrate him entering the world, we cannot uh, do that apart from losing and, and, and lose sight of his dying on the cross and leaving this world uh, to become our our advocate uh, on the, at the right hand of the throne of God. So we pray that, again, we've learned something uh, a, a little more than we knew before. And we pray that you'll have a blessed and God-honoring Christmas and a better new year, a uh, blessed new year, better new year than we've had in 2020. So until such time as we come together again, may God bless and keep you. Uh, by the way, just a reminder of the uh, interactive uh, lesson we will be beginning on Sunday, this Sunday, December 20th, at uh, beginning at noon, 12 p.m. and lasting until 1 p.m. Central Time. For those who are able to join us, uh, please do so by calling one four two five. Three, I'm sorry, 425-436-6307. The phone number, 1-425-436-6307. And punch in access code 647081-POUND. 647081-POUND. Again, may God bless you and keep you.